Welcome back. So we're continuing with our Lyra 3v3 mode. And uh, today we're going to focus on spectating and enabling an experience in between rounds so you're not just staring at the ground like we were in our, uh, in our previous episode. So a couple of things we're gonna do. Uh, first, we will create a new spectator class. Uh, that is the class we will possess uh, when we completed our death cycle, uh, which will enable us to bounce between the live players that are left on our team. Uh, we'll enhance our HUD scoring widget so that we can actually see what our team score is. Uh, and we'll finish our spectate widget, which is where the bulk of today's video will be focused on that spectate widget and kind of interacting with that widget. And we chose this time to do a few debugging of issues live. Uh, well, not really live, but uh, show you kind of how we resolve a couple of issues, walk the code, uh, more to help people understand kind of some of the things that are happening in the background and how they might present themselves as issues uh, when you're trying to build a, a different game mode. And so to do that, we'll explore the character death a little bit more and hopefully that'll give everyone a little more insight. But first, let's see how the game uh, is progressing with sort of some in-game uh, activities. Okay, let's uh, jump in editor and play a few rounds. All right, so I've been eliminated, and pretty soon my spectate window will light up. There it is. And I can now toggle. Oh, they just died, so we're down to one player. And our team lost the round, not surprising. We see our round score updating on the top of the HUD, and we're zoned back in. Let's try to do a little bit better. It does lag a lot when I'm on this monitor. Ah, more lag. And that's the end of the match. Match should reset to zero, zero. And we're on to the next match. All right, so let's go look at the actors and uh, some of the setup. So let's start with the spectator class. So for the spectator class, uh, you simply create a child actor of a spectator pawn. And in our case, we uh, it'll come in with just the uh, collision sphere. Uh, we added a spring arm and then a camera so that when we possess the spectator class between rounds, uh, our camera manager from our player controller will automatically uh, associate itself with that new camera. The spring, spring arm pushes us backwards from the playing, uh, what we're calling the follow character. And so our camera sits sort of behind uh, the, the, the actual player. And uh, that's pretty much it. We turned off uh, all the inputs on this and uh, we will actually attach it to the following character 
when we're in game. So I'll show you that in a few minutes. So we first create that class, just again, very basic class. The change to the scoring HUD, um, the scoring widget, sorry, that is added to the HUD uh, was also quite simple. Uh, we added a, a new text block. We just copied the clock uh, down, put a vertical box around that. So in, in this case, when you open it, you're just gonna see clock. We put the vertical box over clock. We duplicated clock to call it match. And that gives us this look here where the clock is on top and then the match is directly below it. We then created a function called update victories. Uh, you will notice when you go into this widget, there is an update scores and we basic, which updates these uh, blue and red boxes. We're doing the exact same logic. We're getting our team's number of victories. We're getting our enemy's team number of victories and we're simply formatting them with a format text where A and B are these two input pins and that formats out a string that looks just like this. And we're just setting that text. So the other thing we had to do was write these get team victory functions in our uh, 3v3 scoring, right? So what we did is we cloned the clock, we cloned update score to update victories. And then inside our 3v3 scoring, we copied the team score the get team score, a get team victories, exact same logic, except now we're pulling our victory tag, which is one of the tags that we created in a prior video and then passing back the score. And of course the victory uh, pin, which we're not using in our widget, but for consistency between the scoring and the victories, we thought let's pass back the victory pin as well. So those are two very simple changes. One creating the actual, um, spectator pawn and two updating the HUD on the top of the screen so that we could see it. The rest of our work has centered around the actual um, the actual spectate prompt that pops up in the middle of the screen and as you were watching as I was uh, in game there were times when the spectate button was grayed out there are times when I could click it uh, there were times when there was an X in the middle of the uh, of the window uh, indicating an unknown amount of time and then it would switch to five seconds just before we respawn back in. So we'll, we'll explore this class in more depth, but I thought at a high level, uh, we'll take a look at it. What we're listening to is three basic messages out of the system. The first is our ability respawn duration message, which in the standard Lyra game just passes through five seconds. That's when you play standard elimination, you see the, as soon as you see the window pop up, it starts at five, it counts its way down to zero and you respawn. We're using uh, two calls of that message. Uh, one we call immediately when you die. And because we don't know how long the match is actually going to, the round is actually going to take, that's when we put the X uh, on the screen, which is the, the trail there that I've got marked with a little X on it. Uh, then when we call it a second time, um, we actually call it with minus one as a trigger. We call it a second time and that activates the five second path, which is on the, on the top of the screen there. So we'll, we'll dive into that specifically. We then sit and listen, um, for a couple of events, right? The, the ability respawn complete message basically says, okay, the player has respawned. So just reset this prompt window back to its native state. Um, and then when, when game event round over is triggered, uh, we also disable uh, the spectate because we're basically all of our players are dead or all the other players are dead, but the round is over. So we disable spectate. So that's, those are the events that we're listening to. We'll spend a little more time into that. Um, the button uh, at the bottom is a very simple uh, two-step process where uh, we basically do, I got it blown up here. So we, when we click the button, we first check whether our spectator pawn is valid. If it's valid, that means I've already created a spectator pawn. And I don't need to create a second one. So I just skip over the creating of a spectator pawn and I pick a new player to follow. If it's the first time in and I don't have a spectator pawn, then I will actually create a spectator pawn and then follow it.
when we uh, create a spectator, basically we are using our uh, this first node, even though it says owning player, it's the player controller. So the owning player in a widget is actually the player controller. That's what it returns off this pin. So we unpossess any characters that we might ha already have, which would be our hero. We spawn in our spectator class, and we really don't care where we spawn that spectator class, just anywhere in the world, but we always want it to spawn, right? So we don't want it ever to fail because of collision or any of those things. So we just spawn it right now at zero, zero. We save it into the variable, and then we immediately use our player controller and possess it. So our player controller possesses that spectator pawn, which makes that our active camera. Then, um, and we'll explore this one a little bit deeper. Then when we pick the player to follow, so after we've created the spectator pawn, uh, we then go grab all six player states. So we're basically getting all actors of a class and that class being the Lyra player state. We loop through all six of those and we do a number of condition checks. I believe the first check is that the player state that we picked up has a valid pawn on it. So basically every one of those conditions is passing through here or raising a, a, a debug log here. So the player state has to have an, a valid uh, pawn on it. That pawn uh, can't be the pawn that we're currently following. So if we're already following a spectator, we don't want to simply assign the same spectator over and over and over again. So if if it's the current spectator, we 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 exit out. Um, it can't be ourselves. So we check to see, is it us? Uh, if it's not us, then we keep proceeding. And then finally, we use the Lyra team subsystem to determine, are they on our team? And if they're on our team, so they're valid, they're not the one we're currently looking at, they're not ourselves, and they're on our team, then we're going to go ahead and say, okay, follow that player. And so we execute the attached to player, which is here. And then we break out of that loop so that we don't uh, keep looking. So as soon as that condition occurs, you'll see this exit here where we break out of the loop and the code ends. In attached player, it's pretty simple. We pass in our, our spectator pawn and the player that we just uh, found here. And we make sure our spectator pawn detaches from any actors that it might have already been on and then attaches to this actor. So it detaches from wherever it was, it then attaches to the new one. And what that will do is it will put that collision circle at the head. If you notice, we're using the socket head here. Because we're saying attach the spectator pawn to the head of this actor and snap to that target, snap to its rotation. So we're basically saying, I want you to put this spectator right on the head of the player I want to follow. And the spring arm pushes the camera backwards uh, our set direction. So rotation and or translation, we can move that camera to where we want it. If we wanted to add your ability to move the camera around, that wouldn't be a problem. We chose not to uh, for the purposes of cheating. So the same reason that we are only allowing you to spectate over the shoulder of your own teammates and why we're not allowing you to move the camera around freely while doing that is we don't want a scenario where two players are on voice chat and the dead player is either roaming around the map freely uh, in spectator mode or rotating their camera around to look behind and they're communicating and basically exploiting that for the benefit of their team. So. We chose to lock you to your characters, not the enemies. And we chose to lock the camera view so you cannot rotate around. Those are just two decisions we made from a gameplay experience perspective. Uh, you're free to do whatever you want, obviously, in your games. Uh, but that's the rationale behind why we did it. Now, there was a couple of issues that we ran into. And I thought it's worthy to kind of pull them up here as well. So we kind of got through debugging and we got down to five uh, primary issues that we were we were faced with. The first, which was the one that we're going to spend our time on here, uh, for whatever reason, when we became a spectator and it came time to respawn back into a map, 
which uh, not always were our weapons being cleared out. So it was occasionally we would come into round two, still holding the shotgun or the rifle when we should have been reset back to the pistol. So that that's obviously a, a problem, a bug that we need to, uh, to dig into, and we have, and we'll share some of that with you in a minute. Um, the other bug we were experiencing is at times the player would respawn in an A pose. And I, and I think everyone knows that that's a common issue across Lyra. Um, it's t related to the timing of the inventory, the weapon, and the uh, item anim blueprint having no linked anim layers. But because we were having issue number one, we think two is actually related to the fact that whatever's happening on our respawn is not triggering all of our events appropriately since our inventory was not being cleared. And we know that the A pose bug is related to your inventory, uh, we're choosing to focus on one. There's an odd bug that is still present. Uh, the third one here, which is in round three, occasionally one of the AIs fails um, a get pawn null check. So for whatever reason, the Lyra bot controller is throwing this error um, only ever on round three, never on round two. And uh, and we haven't tracked it down yet. That's just odd. And, you know, once we figure it out, we will let you guys know. And then occasionally, sometimes all the players are dead, but the score didn't get to the required score count. Now, we think this might have to do with spawning bots into a match. And in fact, that not all players were spawned in appropriately. And therefore, if only five players respond in and you happen to kill uh, two of the players that were should have been a team of three, but they're only a team of two, uh, there's no third player for you to kill and there's no one to shoot back at you. So you kind of get into this stalemate. So we, we're digging into that. It doesn't seem to happen that often, but we'll figure out what it is. And then the last one was this playing of a montage uh, that was on the wrong skeleton. And I, we think two and five were, well, we know two and five were related to number one. Um, three and four were still outstanding. So with that, let's talk a little bit about how we determined where our issue was uh, for, the, uh, for the respawn event. And in order to figure out the respawn and why the inventory wasn't clearing, we had to step back uh, and look at the sequence of activities and events that occur as you go through uh, sort of a death. So if you think about the sequence of what's happening inside Lyra, the first where you have to start all your debugging and thinking is that health is an attribute on the ability system. And if you remember from previous videos, the ability system is uh, attached to the player state the ability system not only has the abilities that your character can perform, but it also has this attribute set, which includes your health. And as you take damage, that health gets reduced. There is a health component that's on the character, the Lyra character, and it hooks into and is listening to uh, events from the, uh, the ability system. So the health component is responsible for listening to changes in health. It then sends those changes out through broadcasts to the rest of the system. And in particularly, it sends out uh, these four that I have on the screen. It sends a gameplay ability event called gameplay event death. Now, what's important to distinguish is there are gameplay ability events. Those events are raised on the ability system and are specific to the ability system. Then there is the gameplay message subsystem, which is a Lyra construct. And those two events uh, are processed in very different ways. So you can send the gameplay ability event to the ability system to perform activities in and around the ability system, such as removing tags, uh, removing abilities, applying gameplay effects, etc. But you may also want to broadcast a gameplay message for non-ability system components to use. And so for that, the Lyra starter pit issues the Lyra elimination message 
which is sort of broadly broadcast out there for any actor to pick up. And then it has two delegates that it fires. Uh, it fires on death started and it fires on death finished. And the on death started and on death finished are picked up by the character. So the character, and you can see uh, my green box is a little bit off over here, but in the Lyra character, if you look at the early code in the C++ file, you'll see that once the health component has been created, that health component is bound. So the add dynamic to the this class, which is Lyra character, Lyra character on death started. So what this piece of code is saying is, look, whenever the health component says on death started, or whenever the health component says on death finished, I want this class right here, the Lyra character, to trigger on death started and on death finished. And so you see here on death started. So this line of code here enables this to fire. So when death occurs, the first thing that happens on death started, we disable movement and collision for our character. That makes total logical sense, right? Once you're dead, you don't want to be taking input anymore. You just want to start your death cycle. On death finished, we set a timer and we let it one more tick. So this is a timer for one, one frame tick. Um, so it pauses basically a, a fraction of a second and then calls destroy due to death, which is right here. And the so once that frame ticks away, on death finished Call, or sorry, once on death finished is called, which may be several milliseconds or seconds after on death start, right? So there's no, there's no correlation that on death start and on death finish occur uh, right after each other. They will likely occur in sequence uh, just by the naming convention that you will start before you finish. But on death finish may show up 10, 15, 20 milliseconds or longer after on death start. So when on death finish is triggered, the system waits one more tick, right? Allows a little more time to expire, calls the destroy due to death, which then fires this on death finish. Now, whenever you see a K2 inside of the code for Epic, this is likely a uh, blueprint implementable event. So this is in fact, what triggers that blueprint node. So there's a blueprint node in the character that is on death finished. This is the line that triggers that. It then proceeds to uninitialize and destroy. So that follows here, where we detach our controller uh, from our character. We set our, because we're inside a character, we set our character's lifespan to uh, one tenth of a second. We disassociate ourselves with the ability system and we hide the character. So if you think about on death finished, on death finished happens after your character has kind of disassembled and all of the visual elements are over. That At that point, it's safe to hide the actor. If you hid the actor on death start, you wouldn't see any of your visual effects, right? It would just, you would just instantly be out of the game. So the on death start and on death finish allows all the various animations and effects to apply before destroying the character. All right, so there's one other thing that's important. So when we perform this logic, we detach from controller and then we eventually destroy the spawn, the, the, the character. So when you, when you then say, okay, uh, not only am I destroying the Lyra character, I'm also unpossessing that character from the controller. And what might that trigger? Um, and so if you look at the Lyra character unpossess, there's a few things that it does during the unpossess. Um, nothing there screamed at us as to what was causing our particular problem. So we need to start walking up the stack. And so starting at the bottom, the green boxes are our C++ classes. The blue boxes are our blueprint. And then, of course, if you've created any of your own hero code, it'll be in the gray box. So 
Uh, a character, modular character, and Lyra character are all C++ classes. We just showed the C++ logic inside of the character where the character gets destroyed uh, on death and unpossessed from the player controller. The next uh, class up the chain is character default. There doesn't appear to be much of anything in character default. Then you get to hero default. And in hero default, the uh, health component is referenced for death processing. So it kicks in, and we'll look at this in a second, hides the weapons, ragdolls, the cleric, etc. cetera. Uh, then you get uh, shooter mannequin, where on death finish clears the inventory. And that's where the aha hit is, okay, if we're restarting with our shotgun, that means the clear inventory didn't occur appropriately. Uh, and that's why we have inventory when we, uh, when we respawn back in. So if we dig into those a bit deeper, uh, so the hero default, so it's directly listening to that health component. And if the death starts, so if on death started and the health component, then it's playing the animation, it's deregistering any sensing uh, as an AI, it waits a random amount of time, um, it then, uh, something's under there, it ragdolls, it hides the equipment, and then it triggers a death event for the hero default. In Shooter Mannequin, we have a couple of things that are happening. On Possessed, we, we get inventory, we're given inventory, and on death finished, we're clearing inventory. So, okay, on death finished, we clear inventory. On possession, we get inventory. So the problem is happening somewhere in here. The other thing we noticed is um, if we look at the HUD, so if you look at the health bar on the HUD, when it initializes under construction, it actually binds itself to a possessed pawn change. So the HUD itself is listening in to whenever you possess or unpossess a pawn. And that was what triggered us to realize that we had structured our, our code slightly differently. And we basically replicate this logic off the health bar. And so that our new spectate is on construct, we bind to the possessed pawn change. If the new pawn um, is is blank, which means we unpossessed from the character, then we enable the spectate button. We turn the spectate button on. If we are a spectator class and uh, we, sorry, if we're a spectator class and we're, we're going away from a spectator, we turn the spectate button off. So this is how we now control the spectate. That fixed these issues, the ones in green. We still have three and four to deal with. But I want to show you kind of how you can see the that code in action as we fire back up into the editor. Okay, first let's show you uh, the bug. And to do that, I need to be the first one to get to the weapon. All right, I have an extra weapon, and I'm going to dive, and I'm going to immediately start spectating. Soon as I can. All right. So now I'm following in spectator mode. If you notice, I have the two guns showing in the bottom right corner as I spectate. And again, everything appears to be working, but the clue is that the guns are showing in the bottom right corner for me. Eventually, our team will get eliminated, as always. All right, and when we come back into the match, we have both guns. So we can immediately switch to the rifle and start, uh, which not the case. Shouldn't be the case. So let's look at our original approach. 
And what we were originally doing was whenever we started uh, the respawn duration message and we followed the path towards the X, we basically eventually got to, all right, disable the spectate button at the beginning. We were waiting one second just to allow uh, you to remove your finger from the trigger button or else you were immediately jumping into spectate mode. And then we were enabling the spectate button. again. So when we were doing this, we were causing problems that as soon as I hit the spectate button down here, and I became a spectator here, I unpossessed, which triggered the disconnection of my controller from the player, which meant that the inventory was never being removed. So rather than having that um, be our problem, instead of waiting a second and then enabling the button, we leave the button disabled when the window comes up and instead we bind to the same event that the ui is binding to and perform this logic to eventually enable the button and so with that minor change made and if i try to recreate the exact same scenario Oh, well, I have a weapon. So I have a weapon. You'll note that I won't respawn. I won't jump into spectating mode nearly as quickly. See that it's grayed out, still grayed out. And now that I can spectate, notice that my guns are empty. Everything else is still functioning the same. I can move around between my teammates. But because I allowed the full death cycle to occur, it cleared out the inventory uh, before I switched to being a spectator pawn. And now when we respawn back in, I should just be given my pistol. And I have the pistol. So one other thing to note, um, I will sort of show you another little element. So I need someone to kill me. Thank you. When I die, I can still move the camera in this mode because the player controller is still possessing the character pawn. There, as soon as the character pawn is dead, I can no longer move the camera left or right. Now when I spectate, again, I am Recurring into a new camera. And I'm actually switching between these two every time I click the button. All right, so as promised, let's look a little deeper into. Um, it's really not much here. The uh, basic pawn with the spring arm and the camera. So for the camera, we offset it a little bit. We changed the uh, height, we raised the camera up a little bit and we angled the rotation a little bit so it pitches down. For the spring arm, we set it to 300 as a length. And then the only other thing we did is um, we disabled the default movement bindings here. And we, for performance reasons, turned off tick, but it's not really that important. So that's all we do to the spectator pawn. We now look at the logic. Obviously, we just talked through this on construct. We're going to start listening for a pawn change event to enable or disable our spectate button. When we initialize the widget, we call this routine down here, start listening and collapse the window. So it's, it starts off collapsed. Our listening is a series of sequences. 
We're listening for the respawn duration message, the respawn complete message, and the round over message. Round over is the easiest of those. We simply set our spectate button off. Um, when we have respawn complete, we reset our spectator state and we shut down our timer. The reset spectator state clears who we're currently following. So it sets that back to blank. If we did have a spectator spawn, we'll detach that from any actors that we might have been attached to and we'll kill that off and blank it out as well. The main logic, these two branches, when we receive that message, we check that it's our, it's intended for us. If the duration is greater than zero, in other words, not minus one. So remember on minus one, we're gonna set it to five. And on any other number, we're going to set it to X. So in this case, we're setting it to X. We put the countdown to false, which is what triggers that X to occur in the middle of the screen. When we set the countdown to true, then the number will count down from five to zero. We basically update the respawn text, play this little intro animation, which again is not very complicated, but basically it plays this intro animation here, which brings the circle into, into view, plays the animation, sets the timer event to start the ticking down of time. And as I said a few minutes ago, we disable the spectate button uh, and then show the window uh, on screen, which again, stays disabled until we receive a pawn change event, in which case we, which is when the actor is finished its death routine and destroyed. And in fact, the controller now has no pawn. Uh, that's the triggering mechanism there. And then everything else is basically pretty simple, right? We, we become a spectator by creating the, that, spawning that class into the world and possessing it. We determine which player to follow. So we get all our player states. We loop through all of that. We do our checks to make sure we're getting the one we want. We check that it's the right team. And if it is the right team, we attach to that player, which simply detaches from anything we might've already been a part of, and then attaches to this new one snapping to the head socket. And that's pretty much it. Okay, to close out this uh, episode, there's a few things in the gameplay loop that we still need to think through. Um, we've largely got our logic working, uh, bugs fixed, except for those few that we just mentioned. But we also have one other thing that we have to think about, which is our scoring logic is tied to having six active uh, players or bots. Uh, we, hard, we hard code our win condition to three kills. And so, as I said earlier, if you end up in a situation where you have two players on one team and three on another team, uh, you can get in a situation where you'll never get to the three kill count because there was only two people to kill. And they won't kill you because you killed both of them. So that's a scenario where if someone were to disconnect, you might find yourself in a scenario where I started with six players, but before I could kill one of them, he disconnected and the kill doesn't count. Um, or for whatever reason, like our bug, where we don't have six players in a round and we end up in a stalemate. Right now, the active players will have to wait for the timer to tick down to a tie uh, and then keep going. We also don't really have a way to get new real players into a round to replace bots, right? So we, we need to have six functioning players at all times. But if someone's queuing up for the game and wants to jump in, but the spots are full of bots, how do we figure out that scenario and how do we insert that player into a series of matches by replacing one of the bots? So uh, we'll probably spend a little time debugging the rest of our logic here. Maybe we'll poke into these topics a little bit before moving on to the character selection. Uh, but at this point, we're, we're largely pretty happy with the gameplay loop of the 3v3. We'll... I'll try to address these last few uh, 
performance bugs, and then we'll move on to the character selection process, which will reset our uh, thought process to a whole different part of the system. Thanks for watching.